So intersectionality actually came out of my effort to think about how to create a word picture so that people could understand what happens when the kind of inequality that they're prepared to deal with overlaps or has an encounter with a kind of inequality that they're not committed to, haven't even thought about, don't experience it themselves, and don't necessarily feel called upon to be present in that. Intersectionality is also a frame. It's a frame that gives us a greater uh, sense of how certain social problems come about, and importantly, what needs to be rethought in terms of the conventional interventions that we create for those inequalities when those interventions come out of narrow or non-intersectional frames. I came across a case that featured a woman named Emma de Graffenried. She was actually representing an entire group of black women who were seeking better employment opportunities at an auto manufacturing plant in the Midwest. She was um, a wife, she was a mom, she was working class, she was really hoping to advance her family's well-being by seeking a different kind of job than the ones that typically were set aside for a woman like her. Um, a job as a domestic worker or a job as a janitorial uh, engineer. These were the kinds of jobs that were underpaid and that were uh, usually without benefits. They weren't the kind of job that would allow you to actually entertain a middle class aspiration. So she was trying to get one of those better manufacturing jobs. So she applied for the job, and like other black women, uh, she was denied. Um, after her denial, she sued the employer claiming race and gender discrimination. Now, the judge that heard Emma's case dismissed her suit. And he dismissed her suit because the employer in question had in fact hired African Americans and the employer had in fact hired women. From the court's vantage point, the fact that they'd hired African Americans and had hired women meant that they did not engage in race discrimination and they didn't engage in gender discrimination. Now, the fact that the African Americans they hired were not women, and the women that they hired were not African Americans, didn't defeat the argument that these women were unable to prove discrimination because the employer had hired blacks and had hired women. So from the court's vantage point, the problem was that for Emma to be able to say, I was discriminated against, she had to say, I was discriminated against as a black person who's a woman. I was discriminated against as a woman who's a black person. That's what she would have had to say. And the court thought that the law didn't allow her to combine these two causes of action into one. But the fact that no judge ever stopped to think, well, why is this not a symmetrical disability? How come um, a, a white class plaintiff can represent all women even though there are differences within them but a woman of color can't represent everyone, and the same with respect to men. So, in, so, so what we had here was a problem uh, of, the, of the belief that women of color were a category in and of themselves. They could not represent themselves uh, on their own, nor could they represent all women are all men. And this is the moment when I really started thinking about pre-existing schemas. You've heard about the story um, about um, the, uh, the father who uh, rushes his son uh, to the hospital who's had an accident and uh, the surgeon begins to operate and then realizes, oh no, I can't, it's my son. And you know, everyone's stumped by this. How can the father you know, rush him to the hospital and the surgeon says, he's my son too. Until it hits you, duh, the surgeon is a woman. But that, it, it takes that extra moment uh, for it to lock into place. Now, just add into that uh, race, um, class, any other kind of schema that takes even longer for it to lock in that your pre-existing assumptions about who this person was um, were all wrong. That's the space for intersectionality.